Hello class, welcome to the next segment in lecture 9, and in this segment we're going to be exploring the idea, uh, the concept of vorticity and also some of the mathematics behind that. So with that, let's go ahead and dive right into it. So the whole concept behind vorticity is it's a measure of how much the fluid wants to rotate or how much rotation is present in the fluid. And I gave the analogy in the previous segment about how, about tornadoes, of course, tornadoes are nice spinning objects. So vorticity is especially relevant in tornadoes, but pretty much anything that spins in the atmosphere will have some sort of vorticity behind it. So this is something that we definitely care about a lot, especially since how powerful tornadoes are and how much damage they can do. But that then uh, gets into the idea of how do we, uh, that thing raises a question, how do we actually quantify vorticity? How do we actually calculate the, how do we actually calculate how much spin is present in a fluid or how much spin is present in the atmosphere? And this uh, vorticity quantity is typically notated as lowercase Greek letter omega, and it's actually a vector quantity. And you'll talk more about this in some of your later dynamics classes, about a little bit more about how exactly this vector works, what determines what direction it points in. But just to get sort of an initial bearing in vorticity itself, the vorticity vector is defined as the curl of the velocity field, of the wind field itself. And the curl is defined as our del operator, which we introduced in lecture one, cross product our wind field, which if you write that out in matrix form, it looks something like this. And I technically say cross product, but really what's going on here is you're actually taking derivatives. So when you go to evaluate this cross product, you'll actually get dw, dy, minus dv, dz for the i hat component of the cross product. And then you're not actually, strictly you're not multiplying things together, you're just taking derivatives as if you were calculating a cross product. And if you evaluate that cross product out, you will get this result for your vorticity vector. So your vorticity vector is equal to this derivative minus this derivative in the i hat direction plus this derivative minus this derivative derivative in the j hat direction plus this derivative minus this derivative in the k hat direction. And if we want to, we can isolate individual components of the vorticity, uh, the vorticity vector that we have, and those also have their own uh, those also have their own symbols. So vertical vorticity, which is the result we get back from k from uh, dotting our vorticity vector with the k hat unit vector, and that would give us just this component dv dx minus du dy, and that's given by the Greek letter zeta, which is fun to write on uh, pencil and paper. I can tell you that <laughs> it's, it's actually not the the uh, there's actually a Greek letter in here that's even more fun to write, if as hard as that might be to believe. But we can also look at the j-hat component of vorticity, and that's usually noted as the Greek letter eta. That's du dz minus dw dx. And then also Greek letter g, which is spelled xi, which is basically zeta, but it looks like an e almost. <laughs> uh, these Greek symbols can be a lot of fun to draw on pencil and paper, that's for sure. And that's defined as dw dy minus dv dz. Now typically, now you notice that in these... These uh these i hat and j hat components those can be important. In fact, those are the horizontal vorticity uh, those are the horizontal vorticity terms, and those can be important in the atmosphere. But typically, the thing that we primarily worry about is vertical vorticity because that's the vorticity vector that is sort of oriented in the x y direction. Because you see, we have this derivative with respect to x and this derivative with respect to y. So that's the amount of spin that's present in the x y plane versus, or in the horizontal plane, in a horizontal plane, we'll take a look at that a little bit later on, versus these other terms which have the zx plane and the yz plane. Yeah, those can be important, but they're kind of hard to visualize, and right now we're just mainly focused on getting sort of an initial bearing on how exactly vorticity works. So primarily what we're going to be focusing on, and mostly what you'll be focusing on in your later dynamics classes, is this vertical vorticity term, which is given by the Greek letter zeta. And let's actually take a closer look at this and also take a look at the, some of the details that surround it. So the sign convention. Uh, by convention, if you've got a positive vorticity, you've got a fluid that wants to rotate in the counterclockwise direction. And in the case of the Northern Hemisphere, that would refer to a cyclonic flow pattern. So like a cyclone or something that's rotating in the counterclockwise, anything that's rotating in the counterclockwise direction. And the opposite sign, so if zeta is negative, that means we have something that's rotating in the clockwise direction, which if we're in the northern hemisphere, that means we've got an anticyclonic flow pattern. And zeta can also be zero. And if zeta is zero, that means that the flow is irrotational, and that basically means that the fluid does not want to spin at all. There's no spin present in the fluid whatsoever. There's no rotation. There's 
it's just a perfectly it's almost a perfectly laminar flow there's no rotation there's no turbulence there's no nothing but in the real atmosphere vorticity is present pretty much all the time there's very few instances where the vorticity is perfectly zero at every single point in the atmosphere so irritational flow patterns yeah you can have them in the atmosphere but it's very unusual to be working with those in any sort of appreciable scale but uh, it is something that is kind of important to keep in mind in fact if we take a look at some examples of this so if you take a look at this flow pattern here you can see how if you follow this flow pattern you can see how it kind of wants to rotate in the counterclockwise direction in fact this is the flow pattern that you would typically see in a northern hemisphere cyclone so a low pressure system that would be present in the northern hemisphere usually has a flow pattern that somewhat resembles what you have on the screen of course this is highly idealized it's not going to look as clean as this one but as clean as this graphic but it is something that it's just sort of a visual representation of what you can see and since the flow actually does want to rotate in the counterclockwise direction then we say that the vorticity is in fact positive positive. and if we turn things around if we have a wind pattern that you can see if we as we fire, follow this wind pattern around you can see it wants to rotate in the clockwise direction and this is a typical flow pattern of what you see in a high pressure system or an anticyclone in the northern hemisphere so the winds all going diverging away from a common point versus on the previous slide where they were all converging to a common point uh, you can see as the flow as we follow the flow it wants to go in the clockwise direction so that would indicate that we have negative vorticity which again represents an anticyclonic flow pattern in the northern hemisphere so that's going to do it for vorticity uh, for now we will revisit vorticity in some later lectures but this is just sort of a basic overview and introduction to the idea of vorticity and in the next segment we will cover something called deformation which is the third and final kinematic flow pattern that we will look at in this lecture so with that i will see you all in the next segment